We're talking today with Dr. Scott Cummins, who is a uh, professor at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine, and he specializes in allergies and uh, the immune system. Um, he sees patients at the allergy clinic there, and he also runs a laboratory um, which is uh, devoted to research into something called the alpha-gal meat allergy. Um, and so we're going to talk about that today. And there's a, a special kind of, you know, characteristic of this allergy where a tick bite is, is involved. So we want to try to understand that and help our viewers um, know a little bit more about this disease. So Scott, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, there's there's growing awareness of alpha gal, and it's kind of interesting because a, a lot of times it's called uh, red meat allergy, and that's a little um, deceiving, I guess. To you know, in terms of what it what it really is, and and what really all the causes can be for the allergy, but uh, maybe you can just give us a, a brief overview of of what the allergy is like, and um, you know, what kind of symptoms. Um, who it affects and so forth. Yeah, sure. So I tend to call it alpha-gal syndrome or AGS for short, because as you mentioned, Mark, the, the, the allergic reactions involve or can involve more than just eating hamburgers, hot dogs, uh, beef, pork, lamb, et cetera. So um, at, the, at its basis, uh, alpha-gal syndrome is... Uh, an allergic response um, to a sugar. Alpha-gal is technically a sugar. So it's unusual in that sense. Most of what we think and know about allergies occurs um, to proteins. So alpha-gal is, uh, AGS is somewhat different in that regard. Um, but that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of its differences from traditional allergic responses and allergic syndromes. The second uh, probably uh, biggest difference is that for people who develop AGS, the reactions typically take um, hours to develop after um, eating beef, pork, lamb, et cetera, or coming in contact um, with foods or medications that might uh, have, have a mammalian product. So, uh, underlying the sort of biology of, of alpha-gal is this very unique distribution uh, where humans don't make this alpha-gal sugar, but all lower mammals, so to speak, do. So uh, any mammal that's not uh, human or uh, certain primates will have alpha-gal sugar as just a part of its DNA per se. So it's present in um, anything from, from cows, pigs, sheep, goats, rabbits, down to cats and dogs. Mm -hmm. um, and when, when folks develop uh, AGS, their symptoms can be um, as severe as what we uh, in the allergy world call, call anaphylaxis. So a severe allergic reaction where you would have hives and shortness of breath and even um, low blood pressure, or they can have other um, more subtle presentations where you, you may just have itching and hives. Uh, interestingly, we've come to be aware of folks who strictly have gastrointestinal symptoms as well. So really no hives, no swelling, no redness, nothing that would really have led you to an allergist but instead they have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, severe abdominal cramping and pain. Um, and we're learning more about these different presentations of AGS as we go along. Yeah, that's amazing. And so there are a lot of, um, I guess, characteristics that make it very hard to diagnose. Um, and, yeah. and that's been, and, and especially, I guess, this delayed response because it sounds like a lot of people who have gotten um, exposure to alpha-gal may have a meal, but they don't associate the meal at all with 
the onset of, of all these symptoms, right? Because they can happen six hours later or, or something like that. Yeah, exactly. If you can imagine having a hamburger for dinner at seven or eight o'clock at night, and then literally nothing happens for four or five or six hours. So all of a sudden midnight, 1 a.m., you start to get some itching or hives or GI distress. And it's just not natural to think about, well, what did I have for dinner as right. the cause of that? So you're a hundred percent correct that the diagnosis can be exceedingly difficult to, um, to make. And, and often there needs to be a little bit of, a, as we say in medicine, an index of suspicion. You have to be aware of the, uh, of the, of the syndrome and almost begin to sort of suspect it and ask questions around it to help uh, patients make the diagnosis. Yeah, and, and this is a really interesting aspect. There's certain similarities, I guess, just between the diagnosis um, and Lyme disease because that's been not very well understood for a long time and doctors just wouldn't even consider it, I guess, uh, initially. So this kind of falls into that basket um yeah and the other part of that too is there's these regional differences and i think this is where the tick populations come into play um so probably in the northeast there is uh, northeast of the u.s there there's a, a a very real awareness of lyme disease and and that may not be true in other parts of of the u.s and and i think that's kind of true with alpha gal syndrome as well right um yeah, so like, so who gets this is kind of an interesting uh, backstory about how it was discovered, I guess, is looking at um, correspondence between, I don't know, one of the things that I read was like, <laughs> it's just like, look for any correspondence whatsoever, uh, you know, in populations of humans and who's getting this um, and who's not, I guess. So, so how did that come about? I mean, the tick, the involvement of the tick, it was kind of mysterious, right? Right. Um, we we understood, and that's sort of probably that's, that's probably an overstatement. We were aware of AGS before we were aware of the association with tick bites. So we had um, we'd had some patients coming, just a few really, um, to the allergy clinic who were sort of telling us a a unique and different story that they they thought they were allergic to beef or pork or lamb or all three um, and that it was not happening right away so they could eat at the restaurant or at home and then it took this this hours of delay um, and as we began to put more and more of these folks together um, obviously our natural question was why is this happening why why are these and at the time that these were adults so why are these adults who have safely tolerated beef, pork, lamb for 40, 50 years, suddenly losing tolerance, suddenly right. becoming allergic to that. Um, and it just, it happened to turn out that there were a few people in our laboratory group who actually developed the allergy themselves. And uh, that, that turned out to be really important in making the association with tick bites, but we were not aware of that at first. The researchers, you mean, mm -hmm. who were in the lab group correct uh, got it oh okay yeah. there's this also there, there's a really interesting um facet to this where even though what what you and i are talking about is predominantly um centered around the u.s population initially this is happening globally and so it turns out there was a, a researcher and clinician in australia dr cheryl van noonan who actually described very similar phenomenon occurring uh, in Australia. And she was seeing it among her patients and she suspected um, ticks, didn't really have a sense that, that the alpha-gal sugar was involved, yeah. but um, it, it began to give some credence to what we were seeing as well. Just this idea that someone across the globe was also seeing a very similar phenomenon um, raised uh, the, the prospect that, that this could have really been true. Mm. And yeah, I mean, 
if it's a sugar and it's in the lower mammals, it's just really interesting, like what happened first, you know, you, you see this emergence of an allergy and then think, okay, there are these similar stories, I guess, but you have to sort of identify the, the sugar, but then how did the tick, I mean, they could have gotten the sugar from anywhere, right, to, to give them this uh, reaction. Yeah. We, we were initially thinking that uh, it made a nice story that the tick bites a deer or a dog or in the Australian case, maybe a bandicoot, but a small mammal that would carry alpha-gal as a part of its DNA. It's a, just a blood group substance. So tick feeds on an animal that has alpha-gal and then goes to the next life stage and bites a human. And in so doing, then it sort of inoculates the human um, with alpha-gal from the lower mammal and probably in the setting of tick saliva um, causes this allergic immune response to be triggered in humans. Makes a great story. And I still think there's, there's possible that that's true, but what our further research has shown us is that the ticks themselves seem to carry uh, an enzyme that may actually create either alpha-gal or a very similar sugar, and it may not even require a blood meal before they bite a human. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So that's still evolving a little bit um, yeah. for us. You know, these is a, is a tough study to do because we generally are in the business of asking people not to get tick bites. Um, so, <laughs> um, right. you know, you've, you got to get the naturally occurring ones. Um, and we don't really want people to keep the ticks on them um, to sort of study how long does that, does it take after a bite to develop uh, yeah. the yeah. allergic response too. Interesting. So, I mean, that's part of the science of, of this study is that you, you can't really um, create the um, environment or or conditions like you don't necessarily want to try to create those conditions i guess yeah yeah that's true that's yeah. right so we use a, a mouse model model there are mice that are um engineered to not have alpha gal um and there you know there's a backstory there there are pigs that also lack uh the ability to make alpha gal and and potentially could be useful as a model as well Right. And so I guess, I mean, there's been in the news lately, uh, the heart uh, transplant from a pig that uh, was engineered not to have alpha gal, I think, was that right? And they, uh, that worked for about two months. Um, and in that case, the, the tick is not a part of the picture at all. It's, it's just the, yeah. Uh, no, it's true. The, the tick is not, um, not part of that picture. It's a, it's a really interesting um, sort of, it's not a side note at all, but, but the biology of this is, is complicated because all humans make an immune response to this alpha-gal sugar. The people that develop AGS happen to make an allergic immune response to the sugar, but because all humans make a, an immune response to alpha-gal, it is the barrier for what we call hyperacute rejection. So essentially the reason you couldn't transplant a pig liver into a human is because we would all reject it right away. And so that's why they initially um, were looking at alpha-gal and could we engineer an animal model to not express it and perhaps it would be a source of organ transplantation. Yeah, yeah. So that existed before we described AGS Oh. Um, and obviously now we're very interested in that, in, in those animals, not only for pork, but, but equally and probably more important um, for the medical aspects. You can imagine you wouldn't want to put a, a porcine heart valve um, in someone who's allergic to alpha-gal. You would sure. rather have that valve come from an alpha-gal safe or alpha-gal free pig. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Um, so you've described, I mean, the, the symptoms or the reaction can be very much uh, different in different people. 
And so that makes it more difficult to, to diagnose sometimes. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, so in terms of getting into the, uh, to see an allergist, for example, you know, how, how does somebody kind of go into that allergist? I mean, are there ways to find out somebody's, I, what am I trying to say? If somebody's bitten by a tick and they think, well, alpha gal is a possibility here, what should they do? I mean, should they, there is a test. Uh, right. for it. Should they get that test? Should they go get that test right away? Or is it, you know, what, what's their course of action, I guess? Um, typically, you're correct. There is a test. There's a blood test available. Um, but we think it takes a few weeks for the allergic response to develop following tick bites, um, if it's a brand new response. So getting the test done right away is, is probably not the best idea. I think there is a period of time where people could test negative. Mm -hmm. Equally, in the same respect that we don't run, um, you know, tick-borne infection testing at every tick bite, uh, we also don't actually do that for the alpha-gal um, syndrome aspect either. We tend to um, take a history and essentially wait for some sense of symptoms to develop. And part of the reason for that is allergy testing by blood work um, in particular can have a fairly high false positive rate. So when we look at groups of people in the Southeast in particular, as much as 20 to 30% of tick bitten folks can test positive, but have no symptoms whatsoever. So we really like for there to be some initial symptoms that we feel could be indicative of, of this allergy. And then we have the testing done to confirm it. Right. So, and, and I don't know if we mentioned, but it's the lone star tick that has kind of been identified as, as the tick that's, that's spreading this. Um, yeah, that's correct bit. in the U S yeah. um, globally, it seems like, there are, there are local species in each of these places where it's been described, um, but correct. In the U.S., we think the Lone Star tick is really the bad, bad offender. Mm -hmm. And that was part of how this sort of discovery of the association was made, because there's areas where the Lone Star tick is a prevalent um, in, in the southeast, I think. Is that, is that right? That's correct. That's yeah. correct. So where we first sort of made this uh, association between the allergic response and tick bites, it, it was, um, you're right, in places where Lone Star tick numbers were high and, mm -hmm. um, and people were pretty heavily bitten. Yeah, uh, there is something to be aware of, I guess, in, in terms of the allergic response is that additional bites can really have an impact. Um, in, in the sense of heightening the allergic reaction. Is that, is that right? So if you're bitten and you, you know you have alpha-gal, mm -hmm. you really want to avoid uh, additional bites. I mean, you kind of want to be hyper-vigilant on that. Right. There's two reasons, I think. You, you definitely are correct. Um, the data are pretty conclusive that additional bites seem to, to not only push your, your blood test number higher, but make often can make people more sensitive. So in large part, we, you know, we ask people to avoid um, all forms of mammalian meat. So beef, pork, lamb, goat, venison, et cetera. And then a, and some patients lose dairy as part of this as well. But what, what we've seen is that if you're, um, maybe you might consider yourself one of the lucky ones who initially is able to continue to eat cheese and have cow's milk. Additional tick bites will sometimes cause that tolerance to wane and you'll actually then have to remove dairy from your diet. Okay. So the, the other reason to avoid tick bites is we think this syndrome will over time go away. 
but, but the caveat is additional tick bites seem to sort of stoke the fire and make that allergic response um, appear again. Okay. So whatever we can do for, um, for tick avoidance really is critical in alpha-gal syndrome. Right. I mean, I guess it's it, it almost would be possible, like having that reaction, additional tick bites might make it lessen. Uh, I, I mean, that that wouldn't be out of the question, um, depending on the on the kind of allergy, I guess. But um, that's not the case. We right. Sure. That's right. Yeah. You're right. You could so, have, it could have been flipped where additional bites somehow desensitized you. Right. But, right. But in large part, that does not seem to be the the way this unfolds yeah so we'll put a little plug in here for uh insect shield which is uh you know if you want to avoid those bites um it's a really easy way to to do that is just put the clothes on you know get the socks and the pants and so forth um there there are other kinds of uh mammalian derived products that that you have to watch out for that aren't just like a steak um right or a hamburger so that's right what yeah. are what are some of those other things so we we i think in passing i mentioned this idea of the heart valves um right so we always like to have conversations with patients um if they're if they develop ags and need a heart valve um, we, we want to be in touch with their providers um but beyond that some of the most common kind of medical exposures are heparin, which is a, a pretty common blood thinner, uh, which is actually derived from, from pigs and cows. Um, there are some pancreatic enzymes that um, people use uh, to supplement if they happen to have had their pancreas um, function diminish or have it removed. And those are often derived from mammals. There's some natural thyroid hormone um, replacements that are that are mammal derived. There's surgical mesh that can be derived from oh, wow. um, from animals as well. So that's just a partial list, but those are kind of the high points. So yeah, yeah that's yeah. I think really where it lends itself to this idea of a syndrome more than just a food allergy. Right. So and I, I think I. I read, you know, different people saying that like red meat allergy is is kind of a misnomer. I mean, it, it and and I, you know, if you if you look on the internet, of course, <laughs> there's a ton of results for red meat allergy, which I guess is good, uh, <laughs> but, the, you know, but it's not exactly what it should be called. Um, yeah, uh, uh, gelatin capsules are another one right and the one that i was very sad to hear about was marshmallows uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh, gummy candy is, oh yeah uh, uh, yeah that fits in there there's certain vaccinations that have gelatin in them as well right so yeah it's um you know and, the, and nowadays right where there's a lot of focus in the in the pharmaceutical industry and these very targeted therapies um and some of the cell lines that are made to produce these fairly fancy antibodies can be mammalian derived cell lines. So mm -hmm. mouse cells or rat cells, um, and we have to just, not, not all of them are bad or a risk, but we just need to be careful and cautious about it. So raising awareness is really yeah. important. Yeah, right. It's just giving more information to kind of arm yourself. Um, there are stories, and I don't know how much uh, these are still around, but, you know, people going to uh, their, uh, you know, PCP and saying, I, I seem to be having this allergic reaction, but there's not a lot of awareness uh, on the part of, of general practitioners about, you know, the connection that might be happening there. So do you feel like uh, doctors are are getting better about this? Are they getting more information um, to be able to help diagnose or, or not? Yeah, I feel like we're getting there, but there's still a lot of work to do. And my sense is that a lot, some of this at least matters where you live. Yeah. Because I do think there are pockets, particularly in the Southeast, but Long Island, for example, there, there are pockets where the population um 
is is fairly affected. And I think in those geographic areas, the providers are really beginning to, to notice this and diagnose people um, quite quickly. But there are other places where we hear stories um, that folks have been um, just sort of not validated for for many years, and and uh, there's you know there's a publication um, from from a group here at UNC that indicated that the the median time to diagnosis was seven years. Um, oh wow! So I hope we're getting better than that, but but you're correct that there's still a fair amount of of work to be done. Mm hmm. Um. Yeah, for sure. I, I was going to say, I mean, in, in below the interview here, we'll put links to resources and we'll, we'll connect with you about the best ones. What, what are the best resources that people can arm themselves with when they go in to talk to a doctor? A lot of times, you know, it's like uh, Dr. Google kind of thing and, and doctors are, you know, encountering this all the time, but um, are there, are there places that a patient could point the doctor to get more info? Yeah, the CDC website um, now has uh, information about AGS and, and links. There are, um, there's various websites, alphagalinformation.org is one. Um, and it's, I guess, sort of widely available in some of the search engines. You know, there's been Gosh, um, there's been publications in the New York Times Magazine. There's Washington Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, CNN. A lot of the major outlets have carried this. Um, so I think those are all helpful. Sometimes the biggest thing, though, is the blood test. And um, most of the, of the samples that are tested for alpha-gal allergy in the U.S., flow through um, one of the uh, core labs called Eurofins Viracore. And their website has a, a, a PDF that you can print off and take to your provider and say, this is how you order it. This is the test number. Um, and I think that actually tends to be fairly helpful as well. Sure. Wow, that's great. Um... Well, I think we've covered a, a, a lot of ground here in a short amount of time, and I, I really appreciate your um, coming to talk to us today, making the yeah. trip to Seattle, as I say. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's great. So we'll, we'll get more resources, uh, resources from you. We'll put some links below the uh, video here, and I think we'll, we'll be keeping in touch um, with you and your, your lab and, and so forth. To yeah, we, find we'd, out more. we'd be happy to, to talk again. Okay, great. Thanks so much. That's Dr. Scott Cummins from uh, the University of North Carolina School of Medicine.